Hey, Sean, um, how you doing today? Hey, Justin, great. It's good to be with you. Hey, I'm really excited to talk about your book. Um, took a little arm twisting. Um, you're, you're not one to do a lot of self-promotion, so I really appreciate you, um, you allowing me to get to talk with you about um, your new book, Rhapsodies in Blue. Um, this is, you know, Sean is um, the founding director of 1455. It's a nonprofit that celebrates storytelling. He's a longtime columnist for Pop Matters. And usually he is sitting in the chair that I'm sitting in tonight, kind of, um, you know, talking to other authors about their work, their, their creative process, and, um, you know, celebrating them. And because he's reluctant to celebrate himself, I will celebrate him this evening and this wonderful new book, which, um, you know, Sean, I'm going to jump right in because one of the things about this book, following on the heels of Black and Blues, um, your your previous collection of poetry, I was under the impression that you had written so much material for Black and Blues that uh, this new book, Rhapsodies in Blue, was going to be um, uh, kind of like a, a part two, if you if you will. But I was struck, one of the things that, one of the things uh, among many that struck me about this book was uh, it, it's not a, a sequel uh, or a part two. The, the poems are really quite distinctive. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my impressions as we go along. But I, I wanted to go, I wanted to ask you about the two books and how the poems uh, are similar maybe, but also how they, where they diverge uh, in your mind and how, how they're distinctive between the two of the books. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, Justin, thank you. Thank you for prodding. You have been on me. And of course, it's always, this is what we do when we're not on camera. You and I, when we get together, we talk about craft and poetry and, and all that stuff. So it's always a pleasure uh, and an honor to talk to you. And I would be remiss. It's a beautiful book. And it's beautiful mostly because the cover uh, features artwork from our interviewer, the artist, Justin Aaron, who, in addition to being a dear friend, uh, is a musician, photographer, poet extraordinaire, advocate for the literary community. Um, those of you that follow 1455 know him, uh, know his devotion to writing series and all that he does. Justin and I met when he ran the Noepe Center at Martha's Vineyard, uh, where I started really writing poetry again in earnest. So for me, uh, in addition to just talking to you, Justin, this is a little bit of a, a full circle in progress because uh, I adore your work. And so you letting me use your your images for this and the forthcoming book, it, it just it just is a slam dunk. So uh, I'm just I'm delighted to be here and I'm I'm happy to talk. So, um, you know, it's a great question. I, I think the way the boilerplate describes this as it's an ongoing project, which I guess on one hand does sound a little pretentious, but when I say ongoing project, it just means when I started to write poetry about music dash sociopolitical through the lens of taking an individual event or figure or work of art and really trying to get at a moment in time or something about our socio-cultural political uh, entertainment world through that, it was an interesting kind of a fun way to rather than say, take a biography of an individual, which I did a lot of when I wrote criticism and I still write criticism, but for me to home in on a particular trait or a particular event was just a way in. And then once you're in there, how do you pack as much information into one or two pages and sometimes a few lines as possible. So it keeps it fresh for me. It's a challenge that kind of, it's a bar that's set that you have to try to hit every time where you're giving enough kind of background info, but you're also having a unique take on something. And I think what's driven this project for me is it generally involves individuals, a lot of them musicians, a lot of them jazz or blues musicians that I don't think are known enough or certainly celebrated enough. So in my very modest way, trying to kind of reclaim some space uh, culturally for them. And if in that process, I turn people on to Charles Mingus or Thelonious Monk or Howlin' Wolf, that's just the extra part 
that is so meaningful to me. It's it's like it's this pitiful but very genuine way that I want to pay back these musicians who have made my life a million times better than it already would be. So so there's a lot of impetus behind this project. And, and what I found is I've written so much about culture and politics and music. There's an inexhaustible supply of subjects, but I certainly didn't like make a list, you know, of musicians to cover some of these come out in, in the moment where I'm listening to a particular song that I've heard hundreds or thousands of times. And it strikes me that this particular moment in time is a way in, and then I run with it. So some of these have been very, well, I guess, appropriately for jazz improvised and then refined. And some of them have been, you know, deliberate where I know if I want to talk about a particular person there's usually an event or an album or something or controversy that allows me to get in. So um, some of these poems were written during when I wrote the poems for the black and blues, but a lot of them were written after that one got published. So it really is a work in progress. Well, I guess one of the things that struck me uh, as far as what, where the two books are different and, and correct me if I'm wrong uh, or if you have a different take, in the black and blues, the the poems um, are uh, how do I say it? Um, th there's there's a there's a lot of um, they're 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 harder in a in in the like in the circumstances of people's lives that you're talking about. I feel like there's something that's real, like kind of gritty in the streets, but. And mostly it's because I think the lives that are in there, they, they were rough lives. And you mentioned social, socio and economic and political, et cetera, cultural, um, you know, kind of world that that uh, artists and a lot of case, these jazz, jazz artists, blues artists, um, people kind of outside the mainstream anyway. But yeah. then, you know, anyway, they've had it seems like they had a rough there's a there's a lot of yeah. rough life in the first book yeah there's something in this book again correct me if you see something different but mm. or if you have a different idea but there's something in this book that i feel like the lives transcend mm. the difficulties even though the life the life circumstances for many of the people you're writing about were difficult as well but there's something um that is is transcendent and um, I wonder if you get that sense too in the work, and if so, where that may have come from. That's it. I mean, yeah. I, well, first of all, I don't think there's ever any wrong answers, right? We, as we both know, as writers and 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 avid readers, and you know, former academics, um, you know, it's all in the eye of the beholder. So what someone brings to a particular piece of of writing is a legit interpretation. Um, I think I I'm very comfortable with that. Uh, in fact, it, to me, it expands whatever the intent was. Um, if someone misunderstands something and like thinks Thelonious Monk was a white guy, they need to be disabused of that, you know, misnomer. But generally, if anyone says, oh, what he's really trying to do in this particular poem is celebrate X, Y, and Z, sure. But I, I think if if I were to, to really try to directly answer your question, I would I would agree that a lot of the poems in Black and Blues had an elegiac sort of, you know, um, a real kind of uh, mournful um, jacuse aspect of but this is this is what we do in our culture. You know, we have these geniuses amongst us and we seldom acknowledge or support them until they're gone. And yet they they left us with these gifts. Perhaps in this one, there's a little bit more light and celebration, um, thinking particularly of like Otis Redding or Dorothy Ashby, some of these figures that uh, my focus is less on. And by the way, these were black musicians in the 50s and 60s that were considered literal second class citizens. Um, that's always in there. But maybe in some of these poems, it's just more um, implied. And, and I'm focused more on what their art did. Hmm. Do you feel like in this book, you the poet uh or you know some aspect of you the poet uh speaks differently through these poems than in the first book you know when we when i saw you recently in fact when we were uh, out on the water kayaking which you know is always a good fodder for deep conversation 
you you asked me a similar question and you know i think one real genuine answer however unsatisfactory is you know i'm a different person when i wrote these than when i wrote the first ones i mean i'm on i'm the same exact person it's the same exact impulse but perhaps some of the some of the way these poems came together um you know i was just in a necessarily different headspace um you know i think most of those first poems most of them were written pre covid um and most of the ones in volume 2 and the forthcoming collection are post covid so that right there i think there's probably something going on there um but i mean yeah the only the only pushback i'd give is that i would say many of the poems from either collection could fit comfortably but i do know what you're talking about i do think there's a different feel um in both in both collections even down to the cover art right the first right. one is is very dark it's black and white yeah. this just explodes with blue in part because of the title um but also because i do think there's this there's this element of uplift uh and that's very intentional well and you can't get away from rhapsody you know rhapsodic you know uh ecstasy and i and i feel like what i love about the collection is you know at once you're talking about these artists you're also i think writing about writing writing about poetry jazz but writing about the artist as maker as creator and writing about this thing that comes through us uh and has come through these these men and women who you obviously admire beyond admire i mean they are you i your love for them and appreciation for what they have brought to your life is you know palpable in the works and that's something that you do so well in all, in all of your work i love that about your essays as well as how you convey your genuine affection for for these artists um but i i feel like there is something there's this rhapsodic um element through this book which i think the way you put and i mentioned this to you when we were kayaking i i really marveled at the way you put the book together and mm. i felt like this this idea of of rhapsodic or ecstasy or being filled with you know this these things that come through the creative mind uh the creative person and the birthing of cre of of form out of nothing yeah uh you do you, that is a theme throughout the book um yeah yeah so no for sure and and listen i i think it's a it's a tribute to you as a thinker and a poet that you picked up on that so powerfully because i don't disagree at all in fact i i, I tend to agree that there it's not just a, a lighter tone but there is this kind of a, 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 it's a triumphant tone as opposed to again I, I don't know if i'm comfortable saying the first collection is mournful but but there is a real you know you're in the alleys figuratively and literally with some of these folks and this one you know we're really focused on the work and and talking about uh why are they important and what did they do and by the way this is not an academic exercise you know i think these poems are each poem is an invitation to the reader check this stuff out because don't take my word for it this is a gateway into a whole other world that if you haven't discovered it is going to change everything <laughs> so that's a great segue do you think you could read the first poem in the book because i feel like that's your that's your your kind of segue moment uh I think yeah you mean you, the you, very the very first poem the very first poem in the book yes yeah i'd be i'd be happy to um you know and then it's it it and we'll get to this i'm sure i think you i think i know where some of your questions are leading which i look forward to but it was very clear um from the outset what was going to be the first poem and what was going to be the last poem and so the first poem i i can say you know i, I didn't write it consciously like this will be the first poem in the new collection in fact i wrote this after the first collection had gone to it hadn't gone to print yet but it was too late to include this but i remember thinking this could have kicked off the whole series um so it was very appropriate i think to to kick this one off and um it it was written under a different title but for this collection it is it's called dubose hayward's blues and as i do in probably half the poems i do a little snippet for context uh because there's a lot going on so i'll read the context and i'll read the poem um american writer edwin dubose hayward's most famous novel porgy from 1925 was the basis of George Gershwin's controversial opera Porgy and Bess in 1935 featuring the compositions Summertime and I Loves You Porgy 
both of which became jazz standards in subsequent decades, indelibly covered by icons ranging from Miles Davis, Nina Simone, Billie Holiday, Sun Ra, uh, et cetera. So this is DuBose Hayward's blues. Even in the 1980s, it wasn't all bad because in English 101, I first read Porgy and Bess and it prepared me for some things, especially when a few years later, Miles smiled and I finally began to comprehend a truth or two that anthologies and college professors can never articulate. Words failing to explain shit like context and cause and effect. And how could summertime break my brain, then build it back up each time, reaching me in its wordless way? Then in walked Bud and Ella and Billy and Nina. So by the time I got to postgrad, I knew more about Gershwin and appropriation and how, once again, Black artists were obliged to reclaim their culture, elevating us to places we wouldn't need to go if the American dream offered what was advertised. Words, again, talking a big game, but coming up empty in extra innings. And why I see Emmett Till when Sun Ra takes his solo on I Loves You, Porgy, proving truths more painful than fiction because it feels real, even to not so innocent bystanders. And maybe that's why a recording from 1960 can kill me in all the right ways, suggesting something about humankind's deficiencies or redemption, and how wood, brass, and wind express what words never could. So you see, this is what it means when I admit, I don't know the blues, but I understand them, or possibly I've got that backwards because my ears discern what my mind can't define. Thank you. Terrific poem. Thank you. Yeah, so when I read this one, um, my first thing was, yeah, this is, a, this is a great poem to start a collection. I felt like I <clears throat> heard, uh, I could hear the voice of the speaker of the poems going forward. I felt like I understood um, where the poet uh, was was living with these poems, and and then and when you, I think when you get it was really with the with the stanza part of the stanza. Then then in walked Bud and Ella and Billy and Nina, and just getting the sense of you of the speaker of these poems that. Uh, it's it to me it reads also as like the birth the birth song of of an artist of of an of someone who's who is a an, an appreciator of art but then is going to you know I mean I know you so I can say this that is going to go on and make art yeah. uh, and I think it's really these kind of last lines about the the hearing and discerning what the mind can't define because that's something that you go back on in other poems and you talk about different ways in different ways. Um, you write about that in different ways, hearing things that, um, I, we'll get to those I'm sure in other poems, but anyway, I, I, I think it's a beautiful poem. And um, again, like that it's, I hear it as like the birth song of a, of, of a poet or of an artist kind of awakening and being awakened by, by other artists. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for that. And, and I think it, it was important to me to contextualize um, you know, to contextualize myself and 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 um, show up in these poems, uh, you know, so it wasn't, uh, you know, voice of God uh, looking down. It's it's talking about how, you know, in American culture um, and education, you know, this is the story of my life in a sense. Like when I first read Porgy and Bess and then I understood. So when I heard Summertime as a jazz cover, I knew what it was referring to, and it really takes you through the 20th century and beyond. Um, so it's doing a lot of work to contextualize, like how we become listeners, how we become citizens, how we become, you know, writers. Uh, you know, it's all in there. 
Yeah, it sure is the poem. I mean, then of course, you know, you touch on appropriation and um, uh, civil rights. I mean, it's um, yeah, it contains it all. And I think that's what sets it. That, that that what makes the poem so effective for the for setting up the the rest of the book. So, right. um, where do you want to go from here, Sean? What poem would you like to read? Um, that's a. I mean, it's a it's a great question. Um, I guess. Um. I could do a couple, but partly because I don't I don't think I've read these uh, in public very much. There's some other ones that I have, um, and also just in case anyone thinks. Not that I would care if they thought this, like, so it's all about jazz, right? And it's like, no, it's it's about, I mean, it's about everything, but there's certainly um, a lot of jazz and blues musicians, um, and I'm certainly not shying away from the fact, you know, not the opinion, but the fact that, um, you know, the life of any artist in any time is challenging. The life of musicians can be exceedingly challenging. The life of jazz or blues musicians but again, a lot of this music was made at a time where, you know, I think for modern ears, it does sound kind of either woke or like a history lesson, but there's nothing wrong with acknowledging like literal second class citizens like these people couldn't perform their music, even some of them that were famous. So it just seems important to always keep that in mind. So I wrote a couple of poems that kind of talk to each other um, because I reference Helen Wolf in the first poem and then I write about Helen Wolf in the second, but um, it's about two epic blues musicians from a 20th century, Lightning Hopkins and Helen Wolf. The first one uh, is called Lightning Hopkins' Bottle. And it's a little too cute, I think, the title, but Lightning Hopkins was a big drinker, um, but also it wants to play with this lightning in a bottle, which, uh, you know, I think the poem tries to explain. So here's the first one, Lightning Hopkins' Bottle. He was lightning in a bottle. That's how it happened to him and so many other unacknowledged kings of the idiom we know now isn't all the rage, if it ever was. Maybe they drank excessively to endure the indignity or embrace the fact they couldn't survive, a little medicine to assuage the pain. Not all of them needed the nectar. Consider Howlin' Wolf hectoring the unrestrained sunhouse saying, you had a chance with your life, and holy hell if that doesn't hit harder than white lightning, or anything that lightens the load, lights up this world. That's what art does, what music is, what the blues are. And I should have, I should have added, um, the, the Sun Ra, uh, the Sun House, Howlin' Wolf quote, I encourage anyone and everyone to go to YouTube. Uh, there's a recording of a Howlin' Wolf concert where it's really like a down home style. It, it really looks almost like a just a, a house party as opposed to a concert. But so, uh, Howlin' Wolf was at the height of his fame, and Sun Ra, who was from an earlier generation, who was you know an older citizen at that point, is drunk, and in the middle of the show, Howlin' Wolf calls him out. And for being a drunk and says, you had a chance with your life. And it's just very beautiful, uncomfortable. It's a, it's a devastating moment, but then Howlin' Wolf goes into his next song and it's, it's remarkable. But so that poem references that moment. Um, so I think it's appropriate. And of course it follows in the book. The next poem is Howlin' Wolf's harp. And in this instance, of course, harp meaning harmonica, which he played. And in, in the video I'm talking about, he plays his song, How Many More Years. Um, again, if you get nothing out of this conversation, talking to the audience that might be watching or anyone that reads these poems, if you get nothing else out of this other than going to YouTube and watching Howlin' Wolf's version of How Many More Years, it's all worth it for me because I want the world, the world would be a better place if more people knew that song and then discovered Howlin' Wolf. But he was a showman um, and at one point, he takes his harp, which he's playing, and he licks it and puts it in his mouth and plays it. It's unbelievable. So it's definitely stagecraft, but it's real. Uh, it's not a joke. So this is Howlin' Wolf's harp. He licked it, not like a lollipop, but with intent. The burden of royal tasters back in the battle days. 
tongue artists whose job was absorbing poison to ensure it was palatable for noble appetites. Wolf's music, his way of explaining, I asked you for water and all you're giving me is gasoline. He'd lick that mouth organ as if eating the blues, taking a bite out of this hard life. As a black man living always under the suspicion of the same things he sang about, killing floors and moaning at midnight, white eyes expecting you to play the fool, to prove your innocence. He licked the harmonica only because he had to spend the rest of his time swallowing the gristle of separate but equal and all the things awful about the South and North. No safe haven then and now, either sitting on top of the world or else you're going down slow, one spoonful at a time. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Powerful. Thank you. Yeah, that poem, both of those, but that one in particular, um, I don't quite have the the words for um, the response to it, but that sense of, um, you know, the artist creating, these artists creating uh, work that changes people's lives that in that is that is beauty that is power that is um that is moving that moves us it makes us feel alive yeah. and yet not recognized um you you use the word indig indignity in the lightning hopkins one endure the indignity mm. uh, or embrace the fact that they couldn't survive and I feel like there's this, I, I guess what I'm, I think what I'm, what I'm relating to in this, in these poems is that, um, that distance between the, the work that is so moving for us and the, um, the life of the person or, you know, who's, who's charged with bringing that, uh, and the indignity, yes, um, the the no recognition, the no money, um, and then when you're when you're um, when you're a black person or a female, then you know it's even it's amplified. You know those of us like myself, I complain about not getting you know maybe not getting the recognition, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But I mean, I I mean I have a you know, it's different for me than people living in the 50s, a black person even now, et cetera. So you know what I'm talking about there, but I guess what I'm really, I'm just reacting to is how really you make through this book, this, this, um, you make it so palpable, this, this, there's beauty that is, and the cost to the individual to make this, yeah. whether they, you know, the cost in a lot of ways, but this is what we do and what they could do. And um, to not have recognition or to not get reward, even, you know, money or yeah. whatever it is. Um, yeah. Well, and, you know, another thing occurs to me um, that doesn't really need to be spelled out, but I think it needs to be called out. Um, even the way we lionize these folks, you know, too late once they're gone this is what I think, and I don't want to, I certainly don't want to go down a rabbit hole of, of talking about politics or, or, you know, um, words or modern sensibilities. But, you know, when we talk about woke, that really does imply like just understanding, having context and empathy. Even when we talk about a Howlin' Wolf or a Lightning Hawkins, the caricature of the drunk blues legend, you know, when we talk about John Houston, the great director or Jack Nicholson, you know, the brilliant actor, or insert name of, you know, everyone from Mozart to, you know, go down the list. The fact that they might have been addicted for long periods of time to drugs or alcohol or any number of foibles seldom is the first line in the biography. So that alone is a framing that's racist. Um, I can't change that. 
we're never going to change that but it 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 these poems are seeking to slap you in the face with understanding that even the even those that respect these people and i it occurs to me I mean, I love The Simpsons as much as anyone, and it's very, obviously it's done satirically, but like Bleeding Gums Murphy, you know, is one of the love, and it's done lovingly, but it's this, you know, older black jazz musician that's a drunk, you know, there's like this just, well, you know, if you played the jazz, you were obviously on the fringes of society. And it's just such an insult because so many of these people were incredibly intelligent, uh, incredibly brilliant, and were just limited by, the the world that they had to to try to thrive in so yeah wow yeah that framing huh it's like uh oh, geez I don't know what to say about that but um uh, <clears throat> so you have that this so this I wanted that there was there's one point in um Miles Davis Miles Davis's uh destiny I think mm -hmm. um you just you 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 have a line I I would I would love to hear this poem I'd love to hear you read this if you'd like but sure. um you have this stanza actually that you say owning your own destiny and the definition of yourself even or especially when an entire system is constructed to prevent exactly that. Um, and I really feel like that sums up um, kind of that struggle. That, yeah. right? you're, you're, trying to, you're trying to define your own self and everything is set up against that. I, I think that that touches on it, a little bit of what I was just trying to articulate. Uh, maybe not so eloquently, but this notion of like Miles knew he was a genius. And, you know, fortunately for him, he did connect commercially. So he had, he was able to give himself some space, but he wasn't waiting to be anointed. You know, he, he claimed that space. So Miles, of course, was known as a difficult man, a difficult black man, just like we hear, whether it's a politician or a CEO, yeah, she's very capable, but she's kind of bitchy. And it's just, it's the same shit we don't hear when we're talking about white dudes. Like, dude, he's a go-getter. You know, he he wants people to fall in line. So with Miles, I think that that's, a, that's an example of a real celebration of a guy that said, I'm, I'm going to change the contours single-handedly. And God bless, he had the, the strength and the perseverance to do it. And it wasn't for, you know, lack of, of obstacles in his way. Wow. Do you mind reading that one? Would you, I'd love would to. You? I mean, it just okay. it makes me happy less to read my own work than just to think about Miles Davis, you know? <laughs> just, um, I think the, the the only context for this poem that I'll, you know, again, is a true story. I mean, 100%. It's actually, there's video, or no, I'm sorry, there's pictures that were taken. Um, in the mid-50s, Miles uh, was a headliner, I, I think at the Blue Note, but in downtown New York City, he was the headlining act. So he was famous. And he stepped outside in between sets to have a cigarette and got hassled by a cop who said, you know, hey, boy, who are you? And of course, Miles being Miles said, that's who I am, motherfucker, um, which was a correct answer to the question. And the cop beat him upside the head and arrested him. So mid set, one of the most popular and beloved musicians in the country was beaten by a cop because he didn't kiss the ring. Um, and it also just shows, of course, the colossal ignorance of anyone rolling up on Miles Davis and saying, who are you? And not kind of being humbled by, I'm that guy whose name is in lights. So that's a true story. And you can see pictures of Miles. It's, it's, it's a frameable poster for anyone's office. It's like Miles with his tie on with a cigarette with blood, you know, gushing down his head. So he was just, he was the greatest, but this is called Miles Davis's destiny. And it references um, his 1957 album, Birth of the Cool, which was actually recorded in 1949, which he was just way ahead of the game. Yeah. Miles Davis had two big things going for him in 1957. He was great, and he wasn't waiting for anyone else to either anoint or deny him. That's cool. Owning your own destiny and the definition of yourself, even or especially when an entire system is constructed 
to prevent exactly that. When being able to decide who's in or out is how C minus motherfuckers design curriculum and approve city codes or decide jail sentences and start wars. Miles grasped what every genius born black before and after him has understood. You can't ask reality. You need to reconstruct it, oblige it. In a silent way, those spaces between notes are screams. The room you make to set up shop and be the boss, even or especially when most of the world won't listen anyway. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. So that, that poem is badass. It's badass about Miles. And I'm so glad I don't know. I know, you know, some of his work, uh, but I don't know a lot. And I will definitely be digging in um, to get to know more about him. In fact, you know, reading this book as, as with black and blues as well, it, it made me go into, you know, listen to some jazz and start to kind of, you know, learn about it and, um, and awesome. dig in a little bit. Yeah, for sure. But this, this poem, you know, it, it just makes some moves. It's really powerful um, and assertive. Um, that second stanza, which I've, you know, we already quoted and then you read. Um, and then that, um, you know, just like the world's not listening anyway, but I'm doing it. I'm yeah. making it. And I feel like what, I think one of the levels that this that these poems are working on, um, first of all, they they empower. There's a lot of in, there's a lot of power in them, and there's a lot of empowering um, of the artists. And uh, but I feel like it's also speaking on a on the level of uh, to to those of to those to makers to creators, yeah. genius or not, and yeah. the that there is an there's an honoring of whether anybody ever reads this or anybody ever listens to this like you are charged you are charged with bringing things through um and we have to own that or we don't own it uh and if we don't own it well shame on us i think is you know you don't say that but shame on shame yeah. on the maker but th that'll also break a lot of uh, it will also break a lot of artists i'm not getting anywhere i'm not getting anything and that can hold up a lot of people Sure. Um, we've had this conversation a lot. Yeah. Um, and then there are those like, you know, Miles is like, hell, I know I'm great and I'm going to just do it. Um, so I kind of want to use that to just um, springboard into, I think one of my favorites is the felonious monks moods, mm. the poem. And I think what you're, what you you have these lines in there. You say, imagine being, being the man who heard them. And you're, and you're talking about the sounds, the notes, the music, right? Imagine being the man that heard them and made them. And I just think to me, this, this resonance through, you know, you're making the rhapsodies, right? You're, you, a lot of these poems, you kind of, one of the gifts I think you give us in these poems is for me, again, being kind of a, a, a not knowing a lot of the art of the people you're writing about um, is you give me, you give me their, some of their work so that I can appreciate where they're coming from. And, um, and so when you're talking, when you write a line like that, um, imagine being the man who heard them and made them. Um, well, first of all, I'm intrigued now. I just, I want to go here with these notes, you know, that, that they, the songs that they made out of, um, you know, from wherever came, come from beyond. Really, it's a, it's such, such a beautiful, such a beautiful line and a beautiful idea. Um, but I guess what, you know, this other idea that, uh, is it the beginning of this poem too? It's like, and not to make a lot of this as artists, but like as creators, mm -hmm. not, being gods but this idea that we're handling something beyond us that's coming through um yeah. these artists are handling as geniuses they're bringing forth things that people have never heard 
Um, we have not, we don't know this. They, how did they even handle it? I wonder if you could talk about where you come from with that. Like, what is it to handle these things or hear these things that, um, that people hadn't heard? How did they hear, you know, so if yeah. you could talk a little bit about that, because I think it's such a beautiful part of the book. Yeah, thank you. I mean, so yeah, I, I, you know, th th this starts to get into kind of the onion where you start peeling back. Like, I think we would all agree um, there's been many books written about the right people that write books um, or make music. It, it's in the best of circumstances, you know, there are these moments, right, of ecstasy when you create. But what I think any experienced writer or artist will tell, you know, younger aspiring is you've got to put the butt in the seat and get the work done. And it's often drudgery. So, you know, all of this work is grounded in that acknowledgement that anyone trying to create, it's tough, lonely, filled with rejection. But for me, again, it gets down to imagine not just being gifted, but thinking and knowing like, you're really good, you're a genius. And the whole system is set up to that wants you to fail doesn't just want to recognize you. Like, so you and me might say, you know, man, our poetry, you know, it keeps getting rejected. It's because blah, blah, blah. These people didn't have any doubt. Like they're, they're, the system did not want them to succeed. Yeah. And so can any of us imagine what that headspace must have felt like when you're hustling and scrapping and you've got to overcome all of that? I think with Thelonious Monk, um, you know, he's a, he was in, he's like Miles in that he labored, you know, in the vineyard for many years, he was never really obscure, but, but I mean, he had a hard time breaking through. And when he finally did, he got on time magazine, you know, the cover, but it was a long road. And even when he was famous, you know, he was eccentric and it's partly, um, you know, because he did, he, he talked when he played and he would get up and do little dances, you know, again, readily, thank God, right? This was at a time in America where we had, you know, ample recording. So you can see for free any number of felonious performances, but, you know, he was an interesting dude. He was eccentric, but rather than focusing on this guy's eccentric, like let's get him into some classrooms to talk about creativity. You know, there was this patronizing, like, oh, felonious monks of far out cat. Um, and, you know, they, they, they just weren't accorded the respect that say, you know, classical musicians would get then and now because it's considered a serious music. And, you know, one of my contentions is that this music is deadly serious, but it also is filled with joy and it's very accessible. Um, you know, there's plenty of jazz that's out there and it's very challenging, just like in literature. There's literary fiction that is difficult. You know, Cormac McCarthy, a lot of his stuff isn't easy to read, but it's rewarding. But there are a lot of writers, you know, um, that that write very accessible, very friendly work. A lot of this jazz music is not only accessible, it's it's ecstatic and it's it actually makes you happy. So I the only thing as like a critic and fan over the decades that I've resisted is when people are like, you've got to be kind of weird and pretentious to like jazz. And it's like the funny thing is it's exactly the opposite. If you give it a chance, um, you might be surprised how good it makes you feel. Um, so I don't know if I'm really answering your question, but yeah, Monk is just a great case study because he was out there um, in a lot of ways. And, and so the fact that he had his own struggles, both inside and outside the industry, um, just make him a hero of sorts. He's, he's a martyr for the music uh, in a lot of ways. And, and you, the proof is always in the pudding. I mean, he's, he, along with Miles and Mingus, Charlie Parker are some of the most covered you know, when, when you look at virtually any jazz album from the 70s on, you're going to find a Thelonious Monk song. Um, everyone loves them. The songs are so playable. They're so, you can do it on guitar. You can do it, you know, on piano. You can do it on trumpet. You can do it scat, you know, with, with the vocals. It's just the music is so malleable to, mm -hmm. and so I love listening to different renditions of Thelonious Monk songs that I know very well and you hear them done in a totally different way. And it's like, that works. Um, you know, that certainly happens with classical music, right? Like you can have a symphony that's then done by piano and it's like, I, I, the melody is still carry. So yeah, I mean, I could, I could talk all day about, uh, about Thelonious. <laughs> Excellent. Um, 
Well, what else would you like to share with us uh, from the book, Sean? Um, well, you know, I feel I, I the only it's funny the only poem that I really kind of earmarked because you um, mentioned it, and I'm I'm so glad you did when we were when we were on our on our uh, adventure last month or last week um, was the last poem, um, and this this I knew this had to be the last poem in the book, and as as I told you, and I'll try to make the story short this poem actually grew out of something I wrote a long time ago. Um, but it basically was and is like a fantasy, which is, um, it's difficult to say which song by Charlie Parker, you know, what's Charlie Parker's signature song. There's, there's quite a few choices, but one of them for sure is now is the time. Um, and it's such a perfectly titled statement of purpose. Um, you know, it's it 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 talks about bebop as being inevitable. Its moment had arrived. It's this celebratory masterpiece. But my fantasy then and now <laughs> is if I if I had like three wishes, I mean, of course, blanket world peace and prosperity, great. But if it was more incremental, I think if I was able to be in New York City and somehow get a sound system on every skyscraper and stop all traffic at six o'clock PM and blast now's the time so that everyone had to hear it. Magical things would start to happen. And then that would filter through the rest of the world. So it's equal parts fantasy and a deeply held conviction, but this poem tries to conjure that up by celebrating what Charlie Parker left us with this song. So the, the poem is, entitled The Bird's Call. Charlie Parker, of course, his nickname was Bird. Um, and the little snippet before the poem says, first recorded in 1945, now's the time is one of Charlie Bird Parker's signature compositions and can be regarded as a statement of purpose for the bebop aesthetic. So this is The Bird's Call. Not blessed with faith and revelation, I have a dream which suspends disbelief, financial constraints, and physics. Seeing myself high in the sky at rush hour and arresting all traffic to broadcast some Charlie Parker. A burning bush before the apocalypse now, everything ceasing and otherwise silenced as this sound scrubs and rewires the collective consciousness, a confirmation. Listen. We've tried everything else, and at this stage of empire, is there anything aside from economics, isms, ologies, and apathy to remind us our best work isn't done behind desks and inside vacated bank vaults? One horn toppling towers of Babel, recreating this world from its wreckage, every salvaged soul suddenly speaking in one tongue able at last to tell exactly what time it is. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, great poem to end the book on. Um, maybe a good one to end our conversation on as well, but uh, a couple remarks about this. Um, when I When I read this, uh, again, I, I marveled at the way that you put the book together. I feel like one of the real, I mean, the poems are beautiful, but the, the structure and the, the, the organization of this, uh, of these poems, um, really enjoyable is not the right word. I just looked at it and I was like, wow, Sean, really, I don't know. It, it's a perfect order, you hmm. know, right order of things and going out on this, but, um, I love, I think this is what you've been building towards in so much of this book is that the power of art and how it has, you know, what it has done for your life and the potential, what it could do if you could blast Charlie Parker in New York City, what it might do for the rest of us at this, you know, precipice that we seem to be on environmentally and politically um, yeah. uh, as and as a species. And so... Um, it's a, it's a, it's a powerful piece. Yeah. I mean, thank you for saying that. And yeah, I, I don't, you know, th that is something I, I desperately believe, you know, as a fan of art, 
um, and an occasional creator of, of, of things, it certainly saves my life virtually on a daily basis and, and makes existence so much more worth living. And I do think uh, there's a very powerful message in, um, you know, really looking, uh, maybe not to the artist's lives, right, but but to the art as a healing force, um, because certainly our politicians and business leaders, um, you know, our religion now has shifted, obviously, over the centuries. But right now, I don't think that anyone would argue in America, our religion is making money and having power. And there's nothing in either of those objectives that promote peace or harmony or lift up other human beings. So on one hand, it's, it's strictly legal. Everyone's entitled, the American dream, to go for what they want. No argument here. But certainly um, for those people that feel lost or angry or disenfranchised and are, are on social media or, heaven forbid, watching the news and watching the talk shows and down those rabbit holes of, of anger and division, I'm not saying putting on music is going to make everything bright and happy, but it certainly is a place to look to be reminded that we're destroying this planet, we're hurting each other, war never ends, and yet we have been capable as a species of creating this beautiful, lasting, utterly positive expression. And to me, that doesn't justify anything or defend anything, but boy, is it something that I cling to. And I feel proud to be part of the same species that produced the Charlie Parker and a Thelonious Monk and a Howlin' Wolf. Um, and, and these poems are a very modest way to carry that torch and shine light on, on these lives that I think should be celebrated. And they do, Sean. It's a beautiful book. Thank you very much for, um, for writing it and for sharing it and for allowing me to, to conduct a little author interview with you. Um, this is the book, Rhapsodies in Blue, Sean Murphy. Thank you. Yeah, Justin, once again, folks, uh, go to justinaron.com. You can see not only this image, you can see the images from his series of, of images. Um, I don't even want to steal thunder. I, I really, I, I can't encourage you more highly. You can also check out his writing and his books, but check out the images uh, and you'll understand why it was so meaningful for me to include that image. And I guess this is a good moment to mic drop. I've got a third installment coming out in January, and that once again will also use an image from my boy Justin Aaron. So, needless to say, on on so many levels, it's <laughs> just it's always an absolute joy to talk to you about craft and 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 poetry and and our mutual endeavors. Um, but thank you for what you do to lift up communities and and lift me up. Um, we'll talk again soon, obviously, because that's what we do. Yeah, well, thank you. You can't help yourself. You got to promote others, but I appreciate that shout out. Um, but um, thanks for letting me talk to you. And uh, when the next book comes out, uh, I hope you'll let me uh, do this with you again. My dance card is never full, brother. We'll do it All anytime right. you want. All right, Sean. Well, All thank right, you Justin. very much. We'll talk soon, brother. All right, take care. All right, everybody, be well. We'll talk to you soon.